Obviously, this court has the, the motion, uh, which has been filed under seal. Um, obviously, it is, discusses matters that are uh, protected by Iowa Code um, and Iowa Rules of Criminal Procedure, hence the necessity of those being filed under seal. I'm not going to discuss the specifics of the evidence. Um, I will generally point out that our motion is specific regarding the information we're saying that was known to law enforcement um, at the time the four search warrant applications were pre presented to a judge. Information identified in that motion weighs heavily on a finding of probable cause that was omitted. And further, there are misstatements within that search warrant application, those four search warrant applications, that, and those misstatements identify my client as someone involved. The reason we filed this Frank's motion is because law enforcement has to provide under Iowa law all information that they know or should know a issuing magistrate would want to know when deciding whether or not a search warrant application is supported by probable cause. Much information was not provided that should have been told. There were individuals providing information to law enforcement that the magistrate was never told about and was never allowed to determine whether or not that individual should be found credible as a source of information by law enforcement. As discussed, I will be much more specific in the filing following this hearing and talk through the specific exhibits and why those support the motion for the preliminary finding. It's our position that the exhibits provided to the court previously and that have been offered today show at least a reckless disregard on whether or not that information should have been provided or was mistakenly provided in that search warrant application. And as this court is well aware, the standard is either recklessly provided or a purposeful misstatement or omission. Whether or not it was purposeful, that is up to the court, but we have at least passed that initial thres threshold of a reckless inclusion and omission such that a full Frank's hearing should be granted by this court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, first off, the state would stand by its written resistance to the motion for a Franks hearing filed by the state on October 31st of this year. Um, the defense has not met its preliminary burden to establish um, a preliminary showing that any falsehood or false swearing or a reckless disregard for the truth took place in the deputy swearing to the search warrants that resulted in the search of the defendant's home in person, or the search of his cell phone and computer, the search of his uh, Snapchat records, and the warrant for the cell tower records. Specifically, and this affidavit is, it's short enough that, that it can be, I'm not gonna read the whole thing here, however, uh, paragraph three of the relevant warrants is the principal uh, showing that I think that it is in controversy here. On November 3rd- Your Honor, I object. The, well, the, state I, is a, the state is attempting to read into the record information that has been sealed and has been identified as private. Your, can, can you identify what you're looking at? Your Honor, I'm reading exhibit? paragraph three of the affidavit in question that the defendant alleges is a false swearing by a law enforcement officer. I'm prepared to uh, present that, that document that is in question in controversy and then point to the court uh, a number of points where uh, the allegation of essentially perjury by an officer, a very serious allegation, is completely disputed by the evidence. 
I, I just was curious if you could tell me um, of the uh, exhibits that we've admitted, which one you're looking at. Uh, this would be, well, from the states, it's States Exhibit 1. It is the sworn affidavit to search warrant. for Chayden Miller's home. And do we think uh, Maybe uh, Mr. Olson knows uh, if that's Exhibit uh, G or application would be Exhibit uh, D, maybe. Are you familiar with what Mr. Molding is looking at? Um, Your Honor, the offered exhibits that were filed under seal contain each search warrant application and each subsequent search warrant that was issued. So if I'm not sure of which specific exhibit, but we have four search warrant applications at issue, all four of them are proposed exhibits and all four of them contain what I believe to be the operative language that, that the state is attempting to read into the public record. Judge, these, these search warrants are, are the, we have to be able to read the matter in controversy into the, the record and, and discuss this in open court. I, I don't understand where the controversy is. is. This is an allegation, or this is a, a, an attestation, a sworn attestation by an officer uh, as to a part of his investigation involving a interview with an associate of the defendant. Uh, no, and the state can present uh, information about whether the um, information the officer provided was uh, reckless or purposeful. So if you can narrowly, I'll overrule Mr. Olson's objections if you can just keep that to, as a narrow focus. Yes, Your Honor. Um, on a attestation, a sworn affidavit on the 4th of November, 2021, the officer swore that on November 3rd, uh, an associate of the defendant showed that officer messages from Jeremy Goodale, co-defendant of the defendant, Snapchat, that state that Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller were involved in planning, executing, disposing of evidence related to the death of Nohima Graver. Um, the uh, information outlines in Snapchat a conversation how uh, Mr. Uh, Goodale and the defendant, Mr. Miller, conducted surveillance on Ms. Graber, uh, detailed the manner in which she was killed, uh, where her body was located, where the vehicle was located, and how evidence of the crime was disposed of. Um, it's, this, is the, this is the principal paragraph that I believe um, the defense hangs its, its hat on in its allegation of false swearing by the uh, law enforcement officer. Um, it was also communicated the location of the body um, which had been corroborated by officers. Um, this, this individual came in after Mrs. Graber's body was located. I would draw the court's attention to the audio of the interview with Juvenile J conducted by Special Agent Kedley with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation specifically to timestamp two minutes, 13 seconds, where uh, J states specifically Quote, it wasn't just Jeremy, it was two people. It's a timestamp four minutes where the special agent asks if uh, Jeremy did it by himself and uh, the juvenile J answers no. When the special agent asks who was he with, uh, the juvenile J states uh, his best friend Chaden, meaning Jeremy Goodale's best friend. Your Honor, objection again, same objection as before. We're at the point where he is reading these the How can I have an application for a Frank's hearing if you, you can't argue the Frank's application? Your Honor, the discussion that we had in chambers and the reason that we seal these exact exhibits he's talking about is to keep them from the public until it's determined whether or not they should be suppressed. The, 
Is this court going to say that the state gets to read into the record the exhibits that this court just sealed? That severely infringes on my client's right to a fair trial because it puts information out into the public, which otherwise would be suppressed and never known. Your Honor, defense counsel is trying to have his cake and eat it too. It's alleging that my officer swore a false affidavit, but when I'm at, uh, pointing the court in the direction of uh, validation to that swearing, he's saying that the court shouldn't look at it. Well, it's, uh, the, the objection is overruled. There's no reason to read through, through the uh, okay. search warrant application because I've read it already and I know what's in it. But also, uh, when you file a motion for a Frank's hearing, uh, and you have a heavy burden of proof to prove that an officer was lying or purposefully deceitful or reckless disregard for a truth, and we have a public hearing, which this is a public hearing, it's going to get out in the courtroom. That's just the reality. So, Mr. Moling, I'll ask you to keep your focus on this Frank's hearing to the narrow subject of whether law enforcement was reckless recklessly disregarded uh, the truth or purposely deceitful. Your Honor, may I hear very briefly? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would ask that whenever possible, this court could order the state to identify by timestamp and a general description as opposed to the specifics of the statements made. This court is going to have the audio that the state is referencing and this court will be able to determine without the state's interpretation or my interpretation on behalf of Mr. Miller's, whether or not it was reckless or purposefully untruthful. The timestamp identification in a general statement should be sufficient for this court to understand. I would ask that the court, the court direct the state on that regard. And I believe I did. So Mr. Molding, with uh, what I told you in mind, uh, you can <coughs> proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, additionally, Jay, uh, JB, along with his girlfriend, Kay, um, the, the question I think that defense counsel is raising here is that there was no uh, causal nexus between the evidence that's presented by, uh, well, that's, I'm spilling over into suppression issues, but essentially that the law enforcement officer um, recklessly disregarded uh, the truth when stating in his search warrant that uh, Chayden Miller was implicated in the homicide of Noema Graber during the interview with JB and his girlfriend. And that is presented to the court in the audio that's been in the record. Additional um, um, uh, general statements from that interview that uh, support the sworn affidavit by the officer. Uh, JB states uh, specific with specificity that quote, they, and it's really important for the court to consider that all of the, um, the pointing to Chayden Miller in the first few minutes of the, of the conversation then starts to be referred to as they. The they in that entire audio interview is Chayden Miller and Jeremy Gooda. Every time uh, JB and K indicate they, they're indicating Chayden Miller as well as Jeremy Gooda. Uh, JB states that they took her car. Uh, that they, or uh, K indicate, JB's girlfriend Kate states that they, quote, took $75 from her wallet. Um, they, uh, K indicates that they ditched the car in the woods, which was borne out by law enforcement's investigation. Um, and K indicates that the defend the reason why she believes that the defendant did it. Chayden, specifically, indicates a motive. Um, and finally, at, at timestamp 1120, uh, John is asked uh, if, he's talking a lot about Goodale, asks if Mr. Goodale was with Chayden during these incidents, and, and John states yes. Furthermore, there are Snapchat exhibits, which are photographs of um, communications contained in States Exhibit 2 on this thumb drive. <coughs> I believe it's clear in the deposition testimony that the court's going to have in front of it that the um, documentation of that Snapchat communication was done but not complete. There, there are missed 
portions of those communications. Uh, and the deposition transcripts indicate that Mr. Miller's uh, name came up during the Snapchat conversations. Um, Your Honor, I, I think that uh, the, the motion for a Franks hearing here fails on a number of grounds, particularly that the evidence that was developed um, by law enforcement both before and after uh, Chayden's execution of the search warrant uh, bears out that search warrant. I think defense counsel is um, mis misquoting the obligations of the parties here. And obviously, a magistrate, or a, in this case, the district court judge that considers a search warrant um, uh, can consider any number of, of things. But it's not the law. It's a misstatement of the law that all information needs to be pre presented to a magistrate um, when considering a application for a search warrant. I would uh, draw the court's attention to paragraph 12 of the state's resistance to the Franks hearing, which sets forth the, the status of the law on that, um, which is that an officer applying for a search warrant, quote, is not required to present all inculpatory and exculpatory evidence to the magistrate. Um, it doesn't constitute a reckless disregard for the truth um, or, a, or a misstatement if the officer doesn't present the entire case from beginning to end, including all possible leads, all possible suspects, all possible motives, to the magistrate when requesting probable cause for a search warrant. All that needs to be presented to the court is probable cause as to the crime committed and the loca location to be searched and the things to be seized. Um, state would posit that the defense has not met its burden to show uh, Certainly not a intentional misstatement by the swearing officer, um, and not even a reckless disregard for the truth, as borne out by the preceding and subsequent investigation. Mr. Olson, more uh, record on the Franks matter. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, as we set out in our, our motion, one of the most important things that was left out was the fact that law enforcement took information from individuals at all. If you read that paragraph in that search warrant, it looks as, as if every single thing that was put in that paragraph came from Snapchat conversation. If you listen to the audio that, that's provided as an exhibit and watch the videos that are exhibit A, it's very clearly not the case. It's very clear that these two individuals, not one as stated in the search warrant application, but two were each giving information, were each correcting each other's information given to law enforcement. And it's very clear as stated out in our motion that one of those individuals was at the park on the day of this alleged murder. That is important. That shows that this isn't just some individual off the street. And I would ask this court to pay attention to what law enforcement says to that individual once that information is provided. And the timestamps for the video are provided in our, in our motion. The individual at one point even says that he didn't even read all the statements or all these Snapchat messages. How? can a magistrate make a probable cause determination when they don't know anything about the person providing information to law enforcement. Iowa code requires that law enforcement tell a judge about a confidential informant or a citizen informant, or if you want to use the language provided in the application, an associate. This isn't a magic word that just because they didn't say confidential informant, it's not a confidential informant. It's a person providing information to law enforcement who is unnamed, who the judge is supposed to trust the officer presenting a piece of paper that it's credible and reliable. How can a magistrate do that without the information actually weighing on probable cause? With that, Your Honor, I will provide a written map through the depositions and point to the specifics of the sealed 
exhibits to further support our motion for Frank's hearing. Thank you. Judge, if I could be heard on the matter of the confidential informant. Uh, go ahead. Juvenile JB is a man who heard and saw evidence that a homicide was committed. He, he knew that there was a missing person. He had in his possession, along with his girlfriend, evidence uh, as to the perpetrator of that crime. And he did the right thing. What somebody is supposed to do when they have evidence of a crime is that he went to the police and he presented that information to the police and the police investigated. And tarring him with some, some implication that he is a, a quote unquote confidential informant, he's confidential because he's a child, he's a juvenile. Uh, this, is not, this is not somebody whose identity is being kept secret for the purpose of him ratting on his friends or turning, turning state's evidence because he was a co-conspirator in, in a drug case. This is a concerned citizen doing the right thing that concerned citizens do when they have evidence of grievous crimes. That is going to the police and presenting that evidence to them to attempt to effectuate justice. This is not somebody with a motive or a motivation in this case. So the idea of him being a confidential informant is, is thoroughly misplaced. Uh, counsel, any further record on the Franks hearing? No, Your Honor, not from the state. No, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, and with regard to uh, defendant's motion to suppress, um, I know that any challenges to the search warrant, the defense has a burden of proof, but there was one allegation uh, made uh, for the motion to suppress that I believe the state has the burden of proof on. Counsel, is that uh, your understanding? Judge, uh, I think our uh, resistance addresses at least part of that um, with regard to the warrants and the um, kind of what I would refer to spinoff issues from those, uh, which we've already argued with regard to the um, status of JB, who we believe is not a confidential informant. But I do believe it's the defense motion on the uh, warrants. Uh, there's certain criteria that apply to that. There is an allegation that the statement that the defendant was making was involuntary. Uh, we would have some short testimony on that to provide you uh, to supplement um, the record here from Agent Ryan Kelly. We didn't, I don't think we discussed this. Uh, Mr. Olson, did you intend on presenting your evidence on the suppression motion first, or did you intend the state to call uh, witnesses first? Uh, Your Honor, I, I would ask that this court um, consider, I think, the exhibits that were filed under seal from defense, as well as those filed by the state, for the suppression motion as well. Um, I think that they're, they're pertinent to both. Um, as far as evidence, Your Honor, um, with besides those exhibits, um, I don't have any evidence regarding the motion uh, or the motions um, for which I have a burden. Um, I do have evidence regarding the involuntary waiver. So it would be my request that the state present their evidence showing a valid waiver and I can present evidence However, I am ready to present evidence right now if the court would prefer that route. Is the state ready to proceed yeah, right we now? We can call Agent Kedley. That's fine. That's okay. We call Ryan Kedley. Do you promise or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Agent Kelly, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you please uh, state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Ryan Kedley, R-Y-A-N-K-E-D-L-E-Y. And how are you employed? I am a special agent within the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Criminal Investigation. And how long have you been an uh, agent with the DCI? Just over 15 years. And you, you do work for the Division of Criminal Investigation, is that right? That is correct, yes. And how long again, 15 years? That's correct. Okay, do you have any other prior law enforcement experience? No, I do not. And uh, just briefly state for the court what your educational background is. Uh, I was a 2005 graduate from the University of Northern Iowa, uh, where I received a Bachelor of Arts degree in the field of criminology. Uh, in the spring of 2007, uh, I began studying at the Iowa Department of Public Safety's uh, Basic Academy, 
which lasted until the fall of 2007 when I graduated and then was posted within the DCI. And what current assignment do you have within DCI? Uh, within the DCI, I am posted to the Zone 4 uh, Major Crime Unit, which encompasses 20 counties in East and Southeast Iowa. Uh, we are by nature a referral unit so that uh, we uh, tend to receive calls from local and county agencies to provide them with investigative assistance for major criminal cases. And over the years of being assigned to the major crime unit, uh, how many different uh, death investigations have you either led or been involved in? Uh, several. Um, if not uh, dozens, potentially over 100 at this point, uh, many, many, many. And did you become involved in the investigation into the death of Noema Graber? Yes, I did. When did you become involved? Uh, that was on the evening of Wednesday, November 3rd. And were you what is commonly referred to as the case agent in uh, this investigation? No, I was not. Who was that? Uh, that was Special Agent Trent Villeta, V-I-L-E-T-A. And you were assisting Agent Villeta as well as other law enforcement here in um, Jefferson County in looking into what happened to Noah McGraver. Would that be true? Yes, that is true. Okay, as, just to cut to the chase here, um, as part of your investigation, did you interview the defendant, uh, Willard Chayden Miller? I did, yes. And when did you interview him? Uh, I believe the interview began at 6.41 a.m. on Thursday, November 4th. And had he been identified to you as a potential suspect in the death of Noe McGregor? Yes, he had. Uh, who identified him to you in that way? Uh, that was the, the previously mentioned associate of Mr. Goodale and Mr. Miller, I, be I believe previously referred to as JB, as well as his girlfriend uh, referred to as Kay. And I know the judge has an exhibit with regard to uh, the interview with JB, but were you the agent? along with others that was interviewing both him and his girlfriend? Yes, one of two agents, yes. So you had received this information directly from him? That is correct. At the time that you uh, interviewed the defendant, um, was it obvious to you and others in law enforcement that Noema Graber was the victim of a homicide? Yes, it was. From what you had been told, uh, whoever the perpetrators were of that homicide, would it have been what you would refer to as a murder? Absolutely. Based upon the injuries and the other information you had at the time? Yes. How was the defendant uh, contacted uh, just prior to your uh, interview of him? Uh, so my interview of the defendant was conducted at the Jefferson County Law Center uh, in Fairfield. Prior to that interview, a search warrant had been executed at his residence and for his person. Uh, at that time, I believe it was Agent uh, Richard Vale of the DCI, V-A-L-E, and Trent Villeta, who had in person approached um, the defendant at his residence. And then the defendant was transported via a fully marked Fairfield Police Department unit to the Jefferson County Law Center. Um, I believe that Agents Vale and Valletta then spoke directly uh, with the defendant's mother about the purpose of uh, conducting a follow-up interview with the defendant. Um, I then concurred with those two agents and then was asked by Agent Valletta to conduct an interview of the defendant there at the law center. And did the interview, the complete interview, take place at the law center? Yes, it did. And how long was it? Uh, just over two hours, I believe. Okay, and generally the times from the beginning to the end of when you contacted the defendant? Um, when I first stepped into the room, I believe it was 6.41 a.m. At around 9 o'clock a.m., um, after taking a brief break, I had re-entered the room and basically indicated to the defendant that the interview was being concluded. The entirety of the interview and your contact with him is recorded, is that right? That is correct. Um, prior to uh, speaking with the defendant, did you read him any type of Miranda warning? Uh, Miranda warnings were read to the defendant by Agent, but by Agent Vale. And you were advised of that? I was present for that, yes. Okay. So you observed it? Yes, I did. And in fact, um, as Agent Vale uh, read through the actual Miranda form, 
Um, he advised uh, the defendant to read along with, and I believe the defendant initialed next to certain items, then signed, and then I signed the same document as a witness to it. How would you describe the defendant's demeanor whenever he first came into contact with you? Um, remarkably relaxed. Um, given the circumstances that he was being woken up at his residence, uh, subject to a search warrant and transported to um, a law enforcement location, and then speaking with two detectives from the state police, um, he was remarkably relaxed and spent the better part of the first 20 minutes discussing his issues that he had uh, with Ms. Graber and- Your Honor, this is getting into, again, the substance of the specifics that are at issue in the, the suppression motion. Uh, I, I understand that the state has to determine whether or not the waiver is voluntary, but I don't believe the specifics of Mr. Miller's statements outside of questions of validity of a waiver um, are relevant to this hearing. Further, they're subject to the order to seal that we have previously discussed. Mr. Brown, uh, any record you want to make on well, this? Judge, I don't know how we're supposed to address the voluntariness issue without getting into some contact that the agent had with the defendant. I understand they don't want this in the public eye, but we're in a public courtroom and the allegation has been made that the statement and the behavior of the police is outside the bounds of the law and that it's involuntary. How can I address that if we don't get into some interaction uh, with the defendant? I don't intend to go through the entirety of the interview or get into the substance of it. It's recorded, we get that. But the, the officer that engaged with him has to be able to provide the court circumstances of his contact with them, why they did certain things, his observations. His observations aren't on the, inter, aren't on the uh, audio, only his statements and the defendant's responses to them. So in order to provide you a fuller picture on this issue, we have to be given some leeway. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I understand case law is clear that questions regarding a voluntariness of a waiver are, you know, regarding intelligence, uh, knowledge of the individual, if they've had contacts with law enforcement or police or the court system before. I mean, I, I have no issue with those questions. It's the specifics of what M Mr. Miller was saying to these agents that's outside of those bounds. That, that's what I'm, I'm just asking this court to direct the witness to, to stay clear of, at least for the purposes of this hearing, because that's not relevant. Well, I guess for this specific objection, um, for the answer that uh, Agent uh, Gedley was getting into, uh, I'll overrule it. I'll just, and I think everybody knows um, that the information we're looking for is whether or not the um, statements he gave were voluntary. So Mr. Gailey's observations about um, Mr. Miller being calm or maybe discussing different topics, those sort of issues are, in my opinion, certainly admissible and relevant. Uh, it's probably, it could probably get to a point where it was piling on with um, just bolstering or uh, unnecessary information, but I don't think we're at that point yet. So maybe Mr. Brown, it might be helpful for you to ask another question. Uh, go ahead. I can do that. So in these initial interactions with uh, the defendant, um, you would describe him as calm, is that right? Uh, remarkably relaxed, but yes, calm. Okay. So tell us about the uh, circumstances of the interview. Where, where was it located specifically at the law center? And what was the setup of the room, if you can describe that for us? Uh, if memory serves, and the best re um, representative of the setup of the room would be the uh, audio video recording of the interview itself. Uh, but this room was a, uh, a fairly small, I would say, 8 by 10 uh, dimensional room. Uh, had a table, um, no fewer than three chairs. Um, uh, I was dressed in, in khaki cargo pants, uh, boots, and a red pullover. 
Uh, my partner at that time, Agent Vale, was dressed in black shoes, black pants, and a charcoal pullover. Um, uh, door leading to the outside, which was approximately 15 feet from the public lobby area. And did you go into the interview uh, with knowledge of other investigative facts that had been learned concerning the death of Noam Graber? Yes. And had, do you believe that you were fully briefed as to the content of what that investigation would have been? Yes. And have you had conversations with Agent Billita, Agent Bale, and other officers, um, Kinsella, and others that would have been working this case? Yes, I did. Okay. Did the defendant ever appear to you to be uncomfortable physically or emotionally in any way? Uh, in terms of discomfort, uh, there was a portion midway through the interview where he became very, very emotional. Um, but beyond that, no, there was no level of um, observed discomfort, no. You said the interview lasted approximately two hours, maybe a little more? That's correct. Uh, did the defendant ever ask to terminate the interview? No. Now, you went over this Miranda rights with them, is that right? Agent Vale did, yes. Okay, and that was on a, a, a sheet that we were, they were printed out? Yes. And you said he initialed those? Yes, he did. Was there any hesitation by the defendant in signing his initials, or did he have any questions concerning what those rights were? No. Did he ever ask for an attorney? No. Did he ever ask for a parent? No. You've reviewed the uh, audio recording of the interview, is that right? It is. Uh, I think you've been sitting here in the courtroom. We know that we've offered that as an exhibit. Is that true? That's true. Uh, does it document, in your opinion, uh, your, the entirety of your interaction with the defendant? Yes, it does. Uh, was there any interaction outside of the room or anywhere else in the law center between you and the defendant that would not have been documented in any way? No. Agent Kedley, thank you very much. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Thank you. Agent Kendall, uh, Kedley, uh, I've just handed you a document that uh, is a sealed exhibit labeled uh, for the record purposes as Exhibit Triple L. Um, Agent Kedley, you recognize that document? I do, yes. Uh, you have a signature on that document, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. That's the Juvenile Waiver of Rights form? Yes, uh, for this specific interview, we use the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Criminal Investigation waiver for juveniles 16 and older. Uh, we believe that it's uh, DCI Form 9. Thank you. And at the bottom of that document, is there a signature that is purported to be of a parent? Yes. Um, you didn't witness a parent sign that form, right? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, who gave you that form? Uh, this was provided to, uh, I think, it, I believe it was brought into the interview room by Agent Vale, who then reviewed it with the defendant, uh, but it was discussed between myself, Agent Vale, and Agent Villada. Okay. And sitting here today, you have no knowledge of any discussion that was held between um, the parent who signed at the bottom of that form and law enforcement? Uh, no direct knowledge other than what information was provided to me by Agents Vale and Valletta. Okay. 
Agent Kedley training and when discussing or when speaking with the juvenile, obviously you're trained to try to find their parents, right? Uh, in terms of uh, in this situation, depending on age um, and then also the severity of the crime, typically um, it's, it's usually the case that we reach out to a, a victim's parents uh, for a waiver to speak to their child. Uh, but again, that's somewhat dependent on severity of the crime and then the age of the juvenile themselves. Let me ask a different way. You're familiar with the Iowa Code says in certain situations you have to reach out to a parent before you talk to a, a minor. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And in some situations when they're 16 or older, you have to make a good faith effort to speak with the parent as a law enforcement officer. You'd agree with that? Agreed, yes. And that good faith effort based on your training is you have to let them know that their child is in custody, right? Mm -hmm. yes. You have to make a good faith effort to let the parent know whatever crime or delinquent act that there's an accusation about, right? Uh, I, I, I can't say for certain. Um, based on my training, again, it's somewhat dependent on, on the severity of the crime when it comes to a juvenile and then whether they're 16 or older or not. Um, we get into the language of forcible felonies and whatnot. Uh, in this case, I do believe that a good faith effort was made to reach out to um, the defendant's mother for the purpose of notifying her that we wish to speak with her uh, child relative to the investigation. Great. Your Honor, may I approach again? Yes. Thank you. Agent Kedley, same sealed exhibit, triple L. In that form, it says the information about the delinquent act or that is charged or that the person's in custody for, right? Like that's on that form. It is on the form, yes. So if you went to a parent of someone who was 16 or older and asked them to sign that form, you as an officer of, the DC, of DCI would tell them, tell that parent, what the act is that you're taking their kid into custody for, right? Uh, can you rephrase that question for me? Just so I make sure that I'm, <laughs> I'm being as accurate uh, as possible. It's a compound question, I understand. <laughs> you're going to speak to a parent because you want to talk to that parent's child who is under the age of 18, but over the age of 16, okay? Okay, yes. You take that form that's in front of you, the blank form, right? You take that That's form. correct, yes. Yeah. And those four items that are on top there, listed out, you talk about all four of those items with that parent, right? Well, I certainly present the document to the parent. Whether I read them to the parent or not, I can't say for certain I would do that or if that's required of me, but I would certainly present the document and um, advise them to read through the document before signing. Got it. And it's your understanding that form is created by DCI and because it's supposed to conform with Iowa law? Correct, yes. May I approach and take that exhibit back, Your Honor? Go ahead. Thank you. Agent Kedley, you were in the room the entire time that Miranda and that form was discussed with Mr. Miller, right? I was, yes. And you've reviewed audio and video. All those interactions are, are recorded. Correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. And so anything from your recollection, if it's maybe a little bit different from on the video, you defer to the video, right? Absolutely. And have you reviewed the video? Is there anything that, at, regarding that Miranda discussion that you don't recall or that you think is, is different from your recollection? Um, I reviewed the, the video at least once, not recently. I've reviewed the audio more recently. so. Again, this is my best recollection, but the audio video would be the best representation of what occurred inside that room. At some point, uh, you were asked to, to end the interview with Mr. Miller, right? That's correct. And that was it an agent who came in and said, hey, I need to speak with you, and you left that room? That is correct, yes. And it's your understanding during that conversation with the other law enforcement officer that, that a parent had asked for the interview with Mr. Miller to stop. 
That is my understanding, yes. And, and recollection, excuse me. And, and your recollection is you came in and then just said, hey, parents said time to stop and you're done. Is that your recollection? More or less, yes. And approximately, would you say that you had been speaking with Mr. Miller for about two hours at that point in time? Give or take, yes. And it was around, I, I think you said around, around 9 a.m.? Just before, I believe, but yes, okay. uh, around 9 a.m. Okay, and obviously timestamps on the video, at least runtime is gonna tell for sure, right? Correct. Do you happen to know whether or not the timestamp on those videos is accurate? I, I don't know. Um, I did a fairly good job of documenting times within the narrative report that I authored um, after the conclusion of the interview. I believe the narrative report was somewhere in the range of 12 pages. And so uh, I did as best I could to make sure that those times are noted. But when you reviewed the, the video, there wasn't any glitches or jumps, like the time ran consecutively to what you saw. Correct, Not the, no glitches or jumps that I observed. When search warrants were authored in this case, did you speak with the juvenile identified as Jay? Were you in that room? Yes, I did. And did you stay in that room or were you going in and out of that room providing information to other law enforcement officers? Uh, I had stepped out of the room at least once. Um, near the beginning of the interview of, of Jay and his girlfriend. Just, we can just talk about wh whether you were in and out. I was in and out at different times, yes. Thank you. And were you providing information to um, the individual who was authoring search warrants or was that Agent Vail? I believe it was both of us actually. Okay. And did you have an opportunity to review those search warrants before they were ultimately taken to a judge? I don't believe I did, no. Okay. So but you were providing information to, to them at different times? Yes, I was. And to them, of course, I mean the author of the search warrant applications, right? The affiant, yes. Uh -huh. And you know other law enforcement officers were too? I believe so, yes. Do you have a recollection of how many photos of Snapchat conversations were collected during that interview of the juveniles identified as J and K? Uh, I don't have a specific number, but it was numerous. Are you talking 5, 20? I'd say somewhere in the range of somewhere between 8 and 15, give or take. Okay. And again, that interaction was audio recorded and at least partially video recorded? I believe so, yes. During your interactions with those two juveniles, they identified names of certain Snapchat accounts, you'd agree? Yes. Neither you nor Agent Vale went in to look for phone numbers or emails that were associated with those Snapchat accounts, right? By went in, what do you mean? That was a confusing question, thank you. You did not look in those juvenile cell phones that they had with them to determine whether these Snapchat accounts were associated with a telephone number or an email, right? You didn't do that. No, I personally did not do that. Um, there was at least some portion of the time where I was speaking directly with one of the juveniles while Agent Vale was um, working with the other juvenile about the um, uh, transition of these Snapchat uh, screenshots to him. And so to what extent he did any of that, I don't know. I certainly did not, though. Yep. Um, thank you. And that was, that was still in the same room. You were just talking to sit people in the same room, right? Correct. And did you have, well, okay. We talked about the audio recording of that, of that interview, and that's a complete recording of your interactions with those two juveniles, right? I believe so. There may have been some introductions between myself and the juveniles in the lobby of the Jefferson County Law Center that may not have been audio recorded. 
uh, but certainly uh, the lion's share of, of the most content being shared was audio recorded, yes. And it's your understanding that there's video recording, but it didn't quite capture all of that interaction, right? In the lobby no, area? No, of the interview room with J and K. It's your understanding there's a partial video recording, right? I believe that's correct, yes. But obviously, have you reviewed that partial video? Uh, yes. And again, any thing that you've recalled or testified to that's different from those recordings, you're going to defer to the recordings, right? Correct. <sighs> to your knowledge, both sitting here today and at the time that you interviewed Mr. Miller, he had no prior interactions with law enforcement, right? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. And that's the sort of thing that, as a DCI agent, you'd look up when you're interviewing someone? Uh, ideally, you would, but not in every instance, because every instance is, is certainly different with the circumstances. Um, in this chance, I, I did not have a chance to do a uh, quote-unquote deep dive of Mr. Miller's history. Um, but I believe I had um, spoken briefly with local law enforcement into whether they had had any previous dealings with him, to which they indicated they had not. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Brown? Um, Agent Kedley, the exhibit that you've been provided by the defense uh, is the waiver uh, that you utilize uh, in this case, is that right? Yes, that is the waiver that was utilized for this case. Okay, and with, it incorporates what I'm going to refer to as the standard Miranda warnings, correct? Correct. All right. It does say at the top of it, waiver for juveniles 16 and older, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. But incorporated within, and my point is, it would be the standard Miranda warning that you would give to anyone who was going to be potentially subjected to custodial interrogation. Would that be true? Yes. All right. That's all. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Olson? Nothing further. Thank all you, right. Thank you, uh, Agent Gedley. You can step down. State have any more witnesses? No, no, no further witnesses. And um, just to confirm, Mr. Olson, were you planning on calling any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. Um, if that is the case, um, would the parties be opposed to a break, a brief recess? That's fine with us. Okay, let's take a ten-minute break. Okay.